a boxer who was knocked down and out. I blacked out at that point. And the clock was ticking. I couldn't comprehend it, I couldn't think. Hear what got him back in the ring. All of a sudden, I felt peace. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Three words in Jesus' name can make all the difference. A San Antonio woman was pulled free from her burning vehicle after her rescuer spoke those powerful words last Friday morning. Scott Love makes only two trips to San Antonio each year for business. It was around 1 a.m. when he saw a car on fire and immediately he went to help. He heard a woman screaming, but at first he couldn't find her because she was pinned below the dashboard. Here's what Love says happened next. The car was just, uh, it had exploded. The engine just was on fire and, and uh, the whole front of the car was and the, the fuel had actually sprayed along the driver's side so that you couldn't, uh, it was hard to get in the driver's door when she would open the door, you could hear the girl inside screaming, you have to save me, you have to save me, I'm burning, I'm burning, help me. As I was standing there, I heard, I heard myself say it before I comprehended it. I heard the last two words and it was in, you know, it was Jesus name. And then I realized what I had said. And so I grabbed her hand again and I said, in Jesus name. And, and that moment, that moment, she said, my legs are free. And I reached in and I grabbed her and she started wiggling out. We pulled her out and her, and uh, and I took her to safety and I was able to sit there and, and of course, uh, pray with her and pray over her uh, until the uh, paramedics and the ambulance got there. Well, here is what was left of that car. And Love says he spoke to the father of the 20 year old. Her name is Michelle and she is expected to recover from the accident. When Love returns to San Antonio in July, he and the family are planning a reunion, Ooh. and that is an incredible wow. story. That's wow. a real miracle story. I mean, just looking at that, that car and what's left of it makes you realize the ability for someone to even get close enough to the flame to help her is pretty astonishing. And just the willingness to say, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go help. I'm not going to turn away from the flames. I'm going to go help. And then getting the door open yeah. and then, well, where are you? And she's trapped underneath the dashboard. Uh, realize in Jesus name is not mm -hmm. some magical incantation. That's not what this story is all about. But the reason we pray in his name is we're saying I'm taking on his attributes. When 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 you you say, the, the gospel is all about Jesus coming and being in your heart. And I like to challenge people. Did you get the weak Jesus when you prayed that? <laughs> or did you get the powerful Jesus who by him all things were created? Did you get that one? And when you say, this isn't going to be on my strength, this is going to be on his strength, his ability. That's what it, that phrase means. I, I am relying on his ability not my ability. Don't use it as some kind of magic thing. But when you truly appropriate the power that is given to us who believe, and that's a sign you believe, you're saying, I can't do this, but in Jesus' name, I can. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Then suddenly miracles happen. He started praying that, and, and then suddenly she said, my legs are free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now she can be out, and that's... Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other miracle is that she was conscious, mm -hmm. having had a, an impact like that, to be able to scream and let someone know she was even still in there. I mean, that God has a plan for her life. It'll be interesting to see where that It'll goes. It'll be interesting to see the reunion where yes. that goes. <laughs> well, in other news, there's a controversial trial happening in Indonesia, a country with the largest Muslim population in the world. And this trial could have far-reaching effects. The Christian governor of Jakarta is facing charges of insulting Islam and desecrating the Quran. Here's more on this story from CBN News reporter Gary Lane. On the first day of his blasphemy trial, Jakarta Governor Busuki Purnama, also known by his nickname Ahok, said he never intended to offend Muslims or Islam. I never intended to insult Muslims or insult the clergy. On that basis, I plead with the judges to consider my exception plea. The blasphemy accusations stem from statements Purnama made while campaigning several months ago. If found guilty, he could spend five years in prison. Appointed by the Indonesian president, 
Pernama is Jakarta's first ethnic Chinese governor and first non-Muslim to serve in the office in more than half a century. This September's campaign appearance led to the blasphemy charges. At that time, Pernama said his opponents were lying by saying the Quran prohibits voters from supporting non-Muslims. <laughs> Outside the courthouse, militant Muslims demand conviction, while Pernama's supporters defend the Christian leader's innocence. He never wants to insult any other religion. He wouldn't tolerate any action against his country and his people. Some fear the trial signals a rapidly growing Islamic militancy in the country of 250 million. Christians represent less than 10 percent of the population here. According to Indonesia's constitution, freedom of religion is well protected nationwide. However, militant Muslim groups often take violent and legal action against Christians and churches. Well, this underlines with the problems with democracy in a Muslim country. Uh, what he's being accused of is saying the Quran does not mandate uh, that you can only vote for uh, a Muslim. And there is a passage in the Quran that talks about it, Muslims cannot be ruled over by unbelievers. And so here you have a Christian governor. Uh, but beyond what the Quran says, uh, good grief, if, if you're going to say it's okay to vote for me as a Christian, and now that's going to be turned into a blasphemy trial where you're, um, you're, you're at risk for five years in jail, uh, that is absolutely incredible. This is going to be a story we're going to be watching, and you know, there's a whole subtext here of Israel and our current Secretary of State saying Israel can't be a democracy and be a Jewish nation all at the same time. Well, I think the, the more relevant question is, can you be a Muslim nation and a democracy at the same time? Uh, there are only two democracies that are also Muslim. One is Turkey, the other one's Indonesia. Both of them are being tested right now. Turkey with uh, what by all accounts is the ascent of a dictatorship trying to drive it into being more conservative as, as a Muslim nation. And then here we have Indonesia where literally free speech is on trial and can Christians run for office. So uh, the trial attorney for that governor says we can't have trial by mob and then you get a sense of some of the protests They've been burning cars in Jakarta. Uh, it's been uh, quite a wild scene, uh, all for him saying it's okay to vote for a Christian. Mm. Well, here at home, while politicians have been debating about the Syrian refugee crisis, the church has often stepped in to provide real solutions. Abigail Robertson shows us how one congregation in Washington, D.C. is doing what they believe the Bible is calling them to do, love their neighbors. This may look like a regular prayer meeting, but those being prayed over might surprise you. A Muslim family recently resettled from Syria who left their country when ISIS invaded their hometown and gunned down many of their neighbors. The family buried their 16-year-old son alive for hours during the raid to protect him from being forcibly recruited to the terrorist organization. Members from National Community Church have gathered to listen to the family's story and learn more about why they fled to the United States. Have you ever met any Syrian refugees before? No. I don't think so. The media gives a lot of, these are bad people, watch out for them, um, you know, all sorts of danger, and I just know that it's not true. <laughs> Pastor Dave Schmidgall and his wife Kate met the family shortly after they arrived in the U.S. They spoke no English and were placed in the expensive city of Washington, D.C. The resettlement agency covered expenses for only three months. The father, Bashir, once an electrician, now feels helpless. In Syria, he was very strong. He was a provider. He had a sure skill set and a profession. Here he feels lost. He's working really hard to learn English, but the pressure to get financial security is, is pretty strong. Kate and Dave realized two major things missing in Bashir's family's resettlement process, friendships and income. They opened up their home to host this event, which solved both those issues, 
and gave the church an opportunity to put a face to the crisis. What's missing is friendship, it's relationship, it's a meal. Those attending not only met the family, they learned to make a Syrian dish called labne, a type of cheese. Each person also gave money toward the family's rent. It was so simple, like we're just making cheese and they're just sharing their stories and we're just praying for them and just to see like God's hands and feet in action to, here tonight was really cool. But what you see happening here is easier said than done. Across the nation, 73%, just the general population, it avoids or is uncomfortable with conversations with Muslims. It takes a little bit of uh, risk to cut past the, uh, the rhetoric and the opinions uh, to, to get involved in areas that are controversial, but there, there are people behind these topics and these issues. Lead Pastor Mark Batterson found that out after his wife returned from a refugee missions trip. Her heart started to break for what I believe breaks the heart of God. And when your wife has a heart for something as her husband, you get a heart for it. Pastor Batterson believes if churches move past the politics, they could change the course of this crisis. Sometimes we confuse uh, political issues with biblical issues. My hope and prayer would be that the church would recognize that this is one of the greatest crises of, of our generation and how we respond to it might just define uh, our future as the church. NCC plans to host more Listen and Learn events with different refugee families in the future. As for Bashir, he started a handyman service with the help of Kate in hopes of one day becoming self-sufficient in America. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, that was a wonderful story. It sure is. What a great outreach. I think we need to recognize that, yes, the refugee crisis is one of the great crises of our time. And you're looking at millions in Europe, uh, tens of thousands here in the United States. But if we take to heart the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, what can we do to help them? And can we look at this not as a crisis, but as an opportunity and a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel? Yeah, for certain. Yeah, I can't imagine how daunting it must be to lose your source of income, lose your home, your family, your friends, not speak the language, and then come and try to get your children established and get life going again. It is an opportunity yes. to make a difference. Well, up next, a boxer with malice in his heart and bleeding in his brain. Watch what happens when he gets floored and see what picked him back up. Juan and boxing were a perfect match. His fists were deadly weapons and his explosive temper found an outlet right inside the ring. But after taking one too many shots to the head, Juan went down, and he wasn't going to be the same if he got back up. I had a assault with a deadly weapon charge, and it wasn't because I grabbed a gun or something. That was a fit of rage. Kid, poor kid did nothing to me. Juan Mancias was 15 when he nearly killed another teenager with his bare hands. His anger began when he was a young boy and in the most unlikely place, the church where his father and grandfather were pastors. So I felt like every single time I went to church, I was walking into a courtroom and why would I want to go through that? Juan stopped going to church. The source of that anger was never feeling good enough for God. And if I'm not going to feel the love or if I'm going to be judged, then I'm going to act out. I took it out in fights. I took it out in just breaking stuff. After the assault charge, his father persuaded Juan, already a skilled baseball player, to take up boxing as a way to channel his anger. Every person that made me mad at school or a teacher, I took it out in the boxing gym. Juan's boxing coach was a Christian, and every workout came with a Bible lesson. One day, Juan took a blow to the head. I told my dad my leg felt funny. I blacked out at that point. From that on, I don't remember. Juan suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a brain bleed, and was rushed to a hospital where he underwent emergency surgery. 
The doctors told his parents he may never wake up. And if he did, he had only a 30% chance of living a normal life. He said, I'm gonna give your son 12 hours. After 12 hours, I'm gonna give him three days. After three days, we're gonna to have to see what you want us to do. I couldn't comprehend it, I couldn't think. I was in, kind of in shock myself. When he told us that, my wife looked at me and she goes, you need to pray. So that's when I went into the, to the extended waiting room and I just cried out to the Lord. Johnny and his wife Helen stayed at their son's bedside, praying through the night. So right now, we're not going by what the doctors tell us, we're going by what God says. I started playing nothing but worship music inside his room during the nighttime. The very next morning, Juan woke up. At that time, it was like God was just assuring us that everything was gonna be okay. After the first week, I seen the turnaround, and on the sixth day, he started telling me he wanted to walk, and I seen that's when I knew that everything was gonna be okay. I knew that God's hand was in it. The path back for Juan wasn't easy. We had to teach him how to eat again, and we had to teach him how to drink again. We had to teach him how to use a straw, how to read, how to spell his name. But I knew that God's hand was in it because it just happened. He, he did so good. Juan regained most of his brain function within a matter of weeks. But instead of being grateful to be alive, he was angry. That day they told me I can't box. I can't play baseball. And when it got real to me, I hated God because I felt like he took everything away from me. As Juan's body continued to heal, his father prayed that God would heal his heart as well. One evening, he talked Juan into going to hear an evangelist at a youth camp service. I was just praying, Lord, please speak to my son because he's not listening to me anymore. I had my eyes closed and I was still praying. And when I seen him get up, I got up and followed him. And so they prayed for him and it was like the Lord just took over. I was so mad at God and all he was trying to do was give me a hug. That's when I gave up. I was like, I'm done fighting, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna win. I couldn't move, I, I felt paralyzed. They prayed for me and then all of a sudden I felt peace. I really feel like I had a spirit of anger in me. That night I felt like it came out and that's when I knew God loved me. Juan surrendered his life to Christ that night. You ever fish for bass? They fight, they fight, they fight, but your job is to keep them on the line. Let them fight till they get tired. Like God let me fight, he let me hate on him, but I always stayed on his line. And now I feel like he reeled me in. The accident, I don't see it as taking stuff away anymore because it gave me an opportunity to touch more lives than I could ever do. Today, Juan has returned to both the boxing ring and the baseball field. But most importantly, he sees God in a brand new light. I don't see God as a judging God. I see God as a merciful, loving God. I see him as a father who wants his kids to be safe. He doesn't walk away from us. We walk away from him, and he's, he's waiting there. God loves you, and he's just waiting for you to come back home. God loves you, and he's just waiting for you to come back home. Uh, Juan's story is a story we all have, where you know we, we wonder, can we ever be good enough? Can we ever do enough right things? The root of his anger at the start of that story was, I could never be good enough for God. Here he is sitting in a church. His grandfather is the pastor. His dad's the pastor. And he says, every time I went to church, I felt like I was on trial. Maybe you felt that because God is speaking to you. He's showing you that there's a better way. It's not that he's holding anything against you. He's just saying to you, there's a whole better future for you if you just let me. And here Juan is saying, I was angry at God. I was fighting with God. And all God wanted to do was give me a hug. God's not interested in your performance. He's not keeping some record of wrongs against you. 
He doesn't have a list. He's not checking it twice. That's not God. God loves you. And he loves you so much that he was willing to pay the price so that you could spend eternity with him. That's the good news. That's wonderful news. And to receive this, all you have to do is do just what Juan did. Stop fighting him and say, Jesus, if this is real, if you really do love me, could you show me? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer. He'll respond. He'll come to you. If you want this, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you and I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you forgive me for all the years of running away. And Jesus, I want to come home. I want to be with you. I want to hear your voice and know that you're in my heart. So Jesus, I open my heart to you. I ask that you come in. I ask that you forgive me and make me new again. And if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to make a phone call. Let somebody know that you prayed. And when you call that number, 1-800-700-7000, uh, there'll be somebody on the other end of the line that wants to pray with you and say good things to you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to tell you God loves you. When you call, we've got something free for you. No financial obligation at all. All you have to do is ask for it. It's called A New Day, and there's a CD teaching. How do you live the Christian life? What do you do now? It's all free. Call us. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, when we come back, we'll be praying for you and your needs. Plus, we're going to introduce you to a man who's now able to shovel snow after suffering for years with excruciating back pain. See how he was healed in an instant after this. Carl Wisniewski is enjoying his life now more than ever. That's because he's finally pain-free. For years, Carl sought medical help, but nothing relieved his aching back. And then one day, while Carl was praying for others, he was healed himself. Take a look. Retired furniture mover, 76-year-old Carl Wisniewski is back to being active. Not too long ago, years of heavy lifting at his job caused him to have chronic back pain. The more expensive the furniture was, the heavier it was. A very severe sobbing would come up on me like a flash of light, excruciatingly painful. And I'd lay on my back and pray. Carl took over-the-counter medication and visited a chiropractor, but the relief was short-lived. Maybe three, four days later, get back at the chiropractor's office again. That's the way it was. Carl watched the 700 Club every day and prayed for his healing. He also prayed for other viewers along with the hosts. When you pray for others, it takes your mind off yourself. And it's just, uh, it does something to you inside. I love to pray. That's just me, you know. On July 22nd, 2016, Carl was watching and praying when he heard a word of knowledge from Terry. I'm kneeling in my recliner, listening intently to what they're saying on television. There's someone else you have an issue with your back. Um, it, it doesn't allow you to actually stand up straight. A lot of pain in the lower back. That's just lift up now. God's setting you free from that. I raised my arm. I said, that's me, Father God. I, I claimed the healing when Terry prayed. And as I was getting up off my knees, the pain was gone, totally gone, subsided completely. I never had a bit of back ache pain since that day. What could I do but praise God as best I could? There were no words to say thank you. How do you say thank you to God in words? It's, it's all in here. It's time for Carl to be healed. God says, I'm going to do something for the boy. 
That's the way I look at it. <laughs> now pain-free, Carl enjoys the retirement he always hoped for. I enjoy my life more than ever before my, in my 76 years. I have never felt such peace of mind and such physical joy. Now I do my housework and my artwork with great detail and great ease, no pain. I can shovel snow, I can do anything today. And the satisfaction and joy when you look at your results, man, that's from God. Thank you, Father. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see someone set free from pain. It's wonderful to see the hand of God move. We want to pray for you for the last little bit of time we have on the program today. Let's do that. Lord, we just lift the needs of those who are suffering and in pain right now. We just ask that you stretch forth your hand to heal them. In Jesus' name, we believe and we receive right now. Someone named Carol, you've got a sprain. Uh, it's an ACL sprain, and God's healing that knee for you right now. It's in the right knee. God's healing that and taking all that away. Irene, your prayers have been heard and have been answered, and that viral infection is gone from you now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Mm -hmm. And Patty, your prayer has been answered as well. Just receive it today. Amen and amen. If you've been touched by God, share your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We leave you this word from Hebrews. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful.